The rituals you can do to conjure demons, conjure spirits to do things for you or give you information or do different things. And yeah, I did all that stuff. Man. I was, I'm a very extreme person, so I kind of just got into the darkest stuff I could find. Um, My name is Jonathan Allen, and this is my story. Well, I had a pretty happy childhood. Um, I had my natural father, but I was adopted by my um, adoptive mother when I was about six, seven years old, and didn't have any contact with my biological mother, so I didn't know a whole lot about her. But my life with my two parents was very happy. We didn't grow up in a religious house. We didn't go to church. We didn't do, but we still had a very loving, it was a good time. Um, then when I was about, 13 years old, there was a neighbor guy who was probably about 17 that befriended me, and he got me into heavy metal like Iron Maiden and Venom and all this like dark, satanic kind of heavy metal stuff when I was about 13 years old, and he got me into smoking pot and hanging out, so I was hanging out with these older kids that were into all that, and so it kind of just, I don't know, my parents didn't like it at all, um, it really caused a lot of friction, but that's just kind of where my life was headed. Um, and then when I was about 17 years old, I ended up running away from home to San Francisco, California without telling anybody where I was going, my parents or nobody. And I was gone for months. My parents had hired detectives looking for me. I had pictures of me at Walmart on those boards. Oh, wow. it, was, it was really, really not a good thing. Um, but what would have happened is I had a psychotic break at 17 and decided just to take off. Um, a hospital in Arizona where I ended up called my parents, my parents came and picked me up, and they could tell right away from talking to the hospital and talking to me that I needed help. So they put me in a mental institution when I was about 17 years old, and they diagnosed me with schizophrenia. So my life kind of stopped right there, and that was about, um, I thought I was never gonna be able to do anything. You know, I thought, I didn't know much about the illness, but the way they were talking to doctors was this was gonna affect my life in a big way for, you know. Um, when I was about 18, 19 years old, I met some people who were in the goth kind of thing and going to goth clubs and hanging out, and they accepted me right away. They thought it was actually kind of cool that I was mentally ill, so I just, um, I got accepted by them, so I joined in with them, and, um, you know, that's when I met my wife and became friends with her was in that, um, goth scene, goth club scene um, in Denver. And um, I was in and out of mental hospitals at the time, but my friends were always, you know, they were always there, you know, they didn't think badly of me. And I think that's why I latched on so tightly with them is because they accepted me and didn't judge me. And it, it was good, it was a good thing, I guess, at the time for me, I thought it was, but it just kept, things kept getting darker and darker and darker. And um, I ended up getting into black magic, like Egyptian magic and Satanism. And um, I ended up in a hospital when I was about 20, uh, I don't know, I'd say, uh, about, I think I was about 21, 22. And um, I lost contact with all my friends. I lost contact with, the, with my wife. I didn't, we weren't married yet, but we were friends. But she, she was the only one that kind of reached out to me. All my friends had kind of abandoned me. And, um, I ended up losing contact with her for about 10 years before we ran into each other again and got married. But before that, I was, I just, um, I had really latched on to the Satanism and um, just like magic and all that stuff. Uh, I ended up getting tons of tattoos. My arms are covered in Satanic tattoos and Egyptian magic and stuff. Um, and so, I did that for most of most of my adult life, just being involved in that lifestyle and um, being involved, you know, with the music, like the black metal, which is satanic heavy metal from Norway. I was into that because I was like the most extreme you could go. And I'm a very extreme person, so I kind of just got into the darkest stuff I could find. Um, and uh, I just I got into Alistair Crowley and a lot of those older magicians that back in the 19th century because their stuff was just like um, messing around with demons and angels and just messing around with some spirits, just stuff that was not, it wasn't good at all. Um, my wife found me a few years ago, about I don't know, seven years ago, 
she found me on Facebook after not seeing her for 10 years after I had left the goth scene. And uh, she ended up moving in with me and you know, we ended up getting married and I, we were both into that, into that got, you know, the, still into this, even though I wasn't going to the clubs very often, I was still into that lifestyle. And we both were. Um, there's a couple kinds of Satanists. There's theistic Satanists and there is atheistic Satanists. Atheistic Satanism believes that you're God, and I don't even know why they call themselves Satanists because they don't worship Satan, they worship themselves. But that's like with Anton LaVey, the Satanic Church founder, and they're not into worshiping Satan as a deity. They're more into worshiping Satan as like um, an ideal, you know, for them. I was more into the theistic, like he was a real b spiritual being that I thought, you know, could give me power and give me influence and give me things I desired. You know, what I mean, I felt like reaching out to Satan was the way, you know, because. The Bible talks about not going after the flesh, but going after the spirit. When you're a Satanist, it's all about the flesh. And you go after it. I mean, you really, I mean, it's kind of like just, you take Christianity and flip it on its head. And, you, you know what I mean? It just, um, when, and we worship the, Satan as like a theistic, uh, like a God. And we, you know what I mean? And we thought he was telling us the truth. And that God was a puppeteer just laughing at us, putting us on the earth to be miserable and be hurt. And me ending up with schizophrenia. I latched onto it because I believed it. I was like, well, why would God, if he loved us, make me schizophrenic? What did I do? You know what I mean? I just, I can imagine, and other people I met in the mental health system who were schizophrenic or bipolar, how much they suffered. I couldn't see how a loving God would do that to somebody when they, wow. you know what I mean? So I, I, to, I thought, well, no, Satan is the one telling us the truth. Satan is the one that wants us to be free from guilt, free from shame, because we get allowed to do the things of the flesh without feeling bad about it. So, you know what I mean? So it kind of, it's just a perverted sense of salvation, in a way. Um, I really got into Aleister Crowley, and he was in the 19th century. He was, it's called Hermetic Magic, and it's a lot of Egyptian stuff, and demon worship, and he was considered the most wicked man in the world in his lifetime because just the stuff he did with magic and the way, I mean, he was about to get sued or get in trouble. And the guy that was going to meet him at the court to sue him or get him in trouble, I can't know the exact circumstances, but he ended up dying on his way to court. And Aleister Crowley took credit, like, well, I, you know, I didn't have to physically touch him, I did this ritual and that's why, you know, and so, I, you know, I'm not sure how real most of that stuff is. I know from reading the Bible that it is real, or God wouldn't tell us to stay away from it. You know, so um, you know, it, it it's not it, it's not a good thing because it tricks you into thinking. You know what I mean? And then, but if you listen to like the music you listen to, Satanists listen to, and all this stuff that's involved, it's like you th when you get out of it, you think, why would somebody want to do that? You know, why would somebody want to embrace something so horrible? You know, and it's just um, people are hurt and misguided, and they just you know they embrace something just like drugs or alcohol or anything like that. You know, they they embrace it. Um, I huh? Do you remember a time where? you came in contact with with a demon like me oh yeah no oh yeah or, oh yeah or, or even yeah we yourself that you think that you believe right you came in contact with. well there's rituals that you do there's actually um it's called the Megeton and there's one called the Goetia and the rituals you can do to conjure demons conjure spirits to do things for you or give you information or do different things and yeah, I did all that stuff, man. I was, you know, I, like I said, I, I got tattoos that, you know, are black magic tattoos up and down my arm and Satan, Satanist stuff. I don't know if I ever actually encountered Satan himself, um, but I did encounter things that were just, you know what I mean, that if you're not into it, it would probably scare most people to death. But when you're into it, it doesn't scare you at the time. It's kind of, you know what I mean? It's like looking at a, a drug addict from the outside. The drug addict's not scared of what they're doing, but everybody watching the drug addict is like scared of what they're, you know what I mean? So when you're on the outside of it, it's pretty scary stuff, but once you're in it, it's not, it's not real scary. Um, but I got out of it. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean. Do you, do you remember a story where, that you can remember vividly where you 
came in contact with one? Oh yeah, yeah. Can well, you tell us about oh yeah. Yeah, no, it, ceremony, a lot of black magic is called low magic, and it's basically ceremonial magic. So you, you have an altar, and you have a sword, and a cup, and a pentagram, and all that stuff. And what, basically what I was trying to do was, um, I was I basically trying to win people, like, like girls, or, you know I mean, to get, you know I mean, like uh, somebody in my life. And... Um, so I basically wanted to use a demon to basically possess somebody to be to you know to like me, and so I did this ritual and I did that and um, it worked. I started having girls like seriously girls that I I never met like there's a, there's a girlfriend I had that all the guys like she had so many opportunities to be with so many guys that were so much better than me and she ended up liking me and I was like well it worked it worked and there's another time where my wife was in legal trouble and I did a ritual and she was going to go to jail for a long time for um, a drug charge and um, I did a ritual and we get a call and the, her lawyer person says oh they're dropping the charges down to a misdemeanor mm. so yeah I mean that ritual worked when I did that for her it worked it worked and so I know it's kind of messed up because we do the same thing like with prayer, you know what I mean? Like when my wife got, you know, better from her liver failure and her kidney failure, I, was, I reached out to God and he healed her. I don't believe reaching out to a demon will heal you. That, no, they don't, not into healing. But other things, especially things that are injustice or things that are of the flesh, the, you know what I mean? Like my wife should have gotten in trouble. Legal, you know, she should have paid for shit. But we use a, you know, what I mean, we use some influence to get her out. Now, I believe as a Christian, we want that person to do it the right way and face their, pro you know, what I mean, stuff like that. But in that context of being a Satanist or into black magic, getting somebody out of trouble, that's injustice. So it's kind of like taking prayer, but. The great thing about prayer is we don't have to buy a bunch of expensive trinkets and do a big ritual and do all this stuff to get something done. You know, we rely on Jesus Christ and we pray about it and God, you know what I mean? That's, that's a big difference. Um, I got out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah, I know. And um, like I said, uh, what happened was basically uh, back in... 2017, I was on my way to Missouri um, to visit for a family reunion type thing. Some people I hadn't seen in a long time. And uh, on the way there, I was reading my black magic books, like Master Crowley books. And um, I was on the way there. And so I was already in going there with that kind of hold on me, going there with that kind of, you know what I mean, energy on me. And uh, I ended up getting to the family reunion. My aunt, a couple of reunion, pulls me aside and she's like, talk to me about, about Jesus. And I told her, I don't want to hear it. There's no Jesus. I mean, and if there is a Jesus, I'm more powerful than Jesus. Jesus can't do nothing to me. You know what I mean? He died on the cross. He failed. And that's what I was telling her. And she kind of just started laughing at me. Like, I'm like, why are you laughing? She's like, because you sound ridiculous. She's like, like, she's like, <laughs> she's like yeah, it's kind of like the skinheads, you know? Hitler lost, okay? Why are, you, why are you, like, holding Hitler up in the air as a skinhead when Hitler lost the war? It's the same thing with worship with Satan that my aunt was laughing about, is why would you worship somebody that just has already lost? Somebody who's, you're, you're, you're you know I mean, that's like cheering on a football team who just lost the Super Bowl. I mean, you don't, I mean, it's, it, it, it seems ridiculous to her. She thought it was ridiculous. So she talked to me for a while and she, told, she gave me a challenge. She said, just go into a church and see what happens. Just go into church and see what happens. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, well, if you're more powerful than Jesus, you're more powerful than God, you're more powerful, just go into church. You shouldn't be scared of it if you're more powerful, then just go. So... I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So I picked, I, so I started researching churches, and I told her, I said, I'm going to find the most spiritual church I could find that'll make this look, you know, all come out looking really good. So I picked a Pentecostal church. And if you know, Pentecostals are spirit-filled. They believe in the spirit. I mean, 
Pentecostals are probably the most extreme form of Christianity. I mean, if I went to a Baptist church, they probably would have just chased me out of the pitchforks. But I went to a Pentecost. <laughs> I went out. I went to a Pentecostal church, and I got there, and I thought it was ridiculous. I thought these people are, were acting silly. You know, I, I, I did it. You know, I didn't take much stock into it. And the pastor said, "Is anybody? He did an altar call. Anybody want to come to the altar and pray or whatever?" And I was like, yeah, God, I'm going to show you all that God has no power over me at all. I'm going to go to the altar, and I'm going to stand there, and I'm going to show you that God can't do nothing to you, and that this is all a bunch of, you know what I mean? That, and so I went up to the altar, and I stood there for about two or three minutes, and all of a sudden I fell to my knees, like something knocked me down on my knees. And this is the craziest thing. I just... All of a sudden, it felt like somebody wrapped, wrapped their arms around me. And I spun around, there's nobody behind me. And I'm like, oh, what the heck was that? Like, well, I think I need to take more of my pills because my schizophrenia is kicking in. You know, like, I thought, I need, and, and by, by this time, my illness had been pretty stable, so I know it wasn't part of that. But anyways, I felt somebody grab me, said, look, there was nobody there. And at this time, I'm on my knees. And all of a sudden, it felt like part of me just got ripped out of my body like it was weird it felt like something in me like it, it, it just felt like part of me just left it was weird the weirdest feeling in the world it felt almost like I thought I was gonna die I thought maybe I was dying and I was leaving my body I, it was weird and all of a sudden I felt all of this love that I had never felt before ever love and all of a sudden all the turmoil in me left and I felt peace and at that time I just started bawling and crying and sobbing I uncontrollably I could not stop crying and I felt somebody wrap their arms around me again and I just let it hang there for a minute and I looked around and there was nobody there again and I just kept crying and I said I and God told me I'm gonna use you I'm gonna use you and I told him I said I said, who, what you, who, you know, basically, like, Paul, who are you? What are you doing? And he's like, I'm Jesus. I'm God. You are, you're going to stop this right now. And I told him, I said, okay. I said, you must be real because I said, I came in here with one mindset, and now I'm at a completely different mindset. It's weird, like something in me completely shifted. I mean, this is, this is, when you talk about doing a 180, I mean, that's a 180. Mm -hmm. And... I told him, I said, I said, I don't know what I need to pray about or what I need to say to you, but I, I, I'll accept you. I said, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord. And I said, you're obviously real. And I said, I was wrong. And I was like weird because all this stuff got exposed to me that was wrong that before I thought was right. And it, it was weird. All, every single um, thing, all, like my bearing on what's right and wrong completely changed in an instant. Like from, I thought this was right and this was wrong. No, now this is what's wrong. It was weird. It was like a complete shift. And I remember my wife knows when I came home from that church service, she, I walked in the door and she's like, uh-oh, what'd they do to you? Like, <laughs> she could tell like right away, like they did something. To, what'd they do to you? You know, you don't look right. She, she, she knew right then that something in me had changed. And so right then, I I went and got a Bible right away and started going through the Bible, just going through stuff. And I had been involved, and I had an experience with a Pentecostal church before. Me and my wife, when we got married, we picked a Pentecostal church to get married in. And we weren't really, you know, it was, we got, so I had experience, and that's how I picked Pentecostal church, because I had experience and knew that they were the most, you know what I mean? And so um, I knew about baptism and the Holy Spirit a tiny bit. So I decided to look into it. And I heard them talking about the church, so I, I decided like right away I need to be filled with the spirit. I need I need to. Be, so I called the church that I was going to, and I asked. I said, "What's the deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What's the deal?" And he said, "Well, he said we believe that Jesus can baptize you in the Holy Spirit anywhere. You don't need to do it in a church service. You don't need to do this." He said he could do it anywhere. I said, "Yeah, but I want it." I said, "And I said, can you, can we pray about it?" like after church, we could pray about it on a day that's off and we can, you know, I want to receive that. And um, because I felt like that's what I needed to solidify, you know what I mean? My walk is, you know, to solidify that what I was real has really happened. And so um, that Wednesday after I got saved, the, 
the pastor called me up front, surprised me. Uh, he called me up front. I didn't think they were going to do that. And I was like, oh, no, what? So I went up there, and him and another pastor put their hands on me and started praying. And I just, I said, Jesus, just, I said, you know, baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Fill me with what I need to do this walk. I said, you convert me so radically. I said, I need this. You know, I, I said, if I'm going to do what you want me to do and right, right, right away, it felt like, like, you know, I don't know, it's like lightning hit me or something. My whole entire body felt like, I mean, have you have ever been zapped by electricity? I mean, when I was a kid, I grabbed onto an electric fence one time and got zapped. That's what it felt like all over my body. And all of a sudden, I, it was almost like I blacked out for like an instant. And then when I came to realize what was happening, I was speaking in tongues. And I was speaking in tongues, and this lady up front's clapping and going crazy because they hadn't seen anybody baptized in the Holy Spirit in a while. And so when they see everybody was just like, oh my gosh, look at that, like, is it like a for real thing. And uh, they had all seen what I looked like coming in. I mean, I had long black hair. I mean, you should see my ID. I still have my old ID with my ID picture of what I looked like that day. And it's, it's, I still have that ID, and I show people what I look like. So the people saw that happen. And so it was pretty amazing. Um, I... You know, and then after that, things just got better and better and better with God. I mean, it was crazy. Shortly after that, my wife had one of her goth, satanic chick friends over to our house. And I had been talking to my wife about praying for healing and how I wanted to pray for somebody for healing and stuff. And this girl had a disease, and she had some visible problems, manifestations in her body of the disease, you know. And... My wife said, well, if this stuff's real, pray for her, you know? And this girl was like, and I said, well, can I pray for you to see, if, you know? And she was like, that's not gonna do nothing. Well, pray what? And I said, well, just let me pray for you. And she's like, okay, whatever. So I started praying for this girl, put my hands on her, started praying for her to be healed. She started bawling. There must be something about God transforming the heart of a Satanist, because he makes us all cry. Mm -hmm. This girl, this girl, this girl, I was praying for her for healing. She, this tough, heavy metal goth girl with the makeup. If you see a picture of her, you would be like, there's no way. But she started bawling and crying and sobbing. And like I said, God must, when there's a goth, Satanist type person, and God changes their heart. I don't know why, but he makes us cry. It's crazy. We all just start crying. But this girl, and the next morning, she spent the night at her house. The next morning, my wife caught me up. She said, she, her, her disease is gone. Her, she has no more sores, no more, her disease is gone. She got healed. And so that was the first time I experienced something supernatural since the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, a couple weeks later, the worship leader of the church asked me, so how are you using your gift being baptized in the Holy Spirit? I didn't know what to say. I was like, well, I speak and pray in tongues. And you know, I knew so little things. But now when I ran up to him in the next church, I said, you want to know how I'm using my gift? Somebody just got healed. And then, yeah, and then after that, I prophesied in the middle of church. God gave me a word in the middle of church. I stood up, and this is a big church I was going to, big, big. And I stood up in the middle and yelled out this prophecy in front of all these people. And if you know me, I, 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 it was weird. I, I normally do that. I interrupted the church service and spoke the word prophecy. And, and then I prophesied to the pastor after that a couple of weeks later. So all this supernatural stuff started happening. Well, I heard about this place a couple months later called IHOP KC, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. And I, I heard about it and I was like, I need to go to that place. I need to check this place out because it just seems so cool. So I flew out to Kansas City in February, uh, uh, right after I'd been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I flew to IHOP KC. And I was in the prayer room for 12 hours straight. I, I could I was just... I know, praying and worshiping, and I loved it there. I would, it was like Disneyland for Christians. It's awesome. And this guy said, we have a prophetic ministry, and I'd like some of the prophets to meet with you. And he said, I'm going to give you my time slot, because when you do it there, you sign up for the prophetic ministry for somebody to prophesy on these little uh, slots. And this guy said, well, it's my time slot. I'm going to give it to you, because the Lord told me you need this prophetic ministry. You need it. You know, need somebody to so I said, okay, I'll do it. And I signed up, and they called me back, and they had three prophets, and they each prophesied over me. And the main thing that they had prophesied over me over and over was that I'm going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, that 
you know, that I walk, in, the way I walk with God is so supernatural. These people didn't know me. They didn't know about the healing. They didn't know the prophecy. They didn't know about being baptized yeah. in the Holy Spirit. They didn't know if I even believed in the gifts of the Spirit. But they told me, this is what your life's going to be like when you walk with God. And after that, that just kind of confirmed it because what had already happened. And ever since then, after that happened, and now I, and I think just my radical conversion, me being involved in black magic, and then all that being shifted on me, made it so I already was in the supernatural in the wrong way. So when I became a Christian, I got super, I was already supernaturally minded. So, yeah, so that, you know, and then, uh, and then I was at that church for a while, and, and then last summer, about, I don't know, what, what was it, like, uh, probably about April, May, I left that church, and I kind of didn't go to church or do anything for a few months that summer. I didn't do a whole lot of anything. I didn't, and then, I figured I had to find a new church because um, I just, I, I had to find somewhere to go. So I uh, looked up Assemblies of God churches in Pueblo and I found Pueblo Christian Center. It was Assemblies of God Church in Pueblo. So I came here on an Easter service actually last, uh, I mean a year, uh, a couple months before I actually started coming. I went to an Easter service here and I liked it but I never came back. Well, then at the end of August, I start, I showed up and started coming more regularly. And I just love this church. I loved Public Christian Center. I just love the heart of it. I love how the pastor came from the fires of revival. So he's already charged up for revival. You know, the, all the pastors are, you know, they're godly men that are transparent and just kind and caring and loving. They don't seem like elitist, like they're separate from the congregation Public Christian Center, their staff is part of the congregation. And that's rare these days. You know, and I, th I think that's wonderful. And then, like I said, I, I went to the Ablaze class, started going that, and Hal and Rhonda Moore started mentoring me and giving me rides to church because for this past year I didn't have any rides to church, so they would always give me a ride. And I went on that. And um, like I said, I, I've been coming to Public Christian Center since la the end of last August. So I've been here a little bit over a year now, and um, I always have this thing with, um, I became, I got saved three years ago at the end of July. So I kind of had this thing in me saying, well, the disciples of Jesus for three years, Apostle Paul went to the desert for three years after he got saved. So it seems like all these men of God had this three-year period of obscurity before they started the ministry. So when my three years was up, God tested my three years. Big time, because it was 2020, you know, COVID and all this stuff. And then he gave me the biggest test possible. He almost took my wife. I mean, she, yeah, she, one morning, a couple months ago, I woke up and I couldn't wake her up. And she had vomit on her face. And I flipped her on her side because I was afraid she, I couldn't see her. You know, she was breathing, like, it sounded like she was breathing through water. It was scary, scary, scary. I called her one. They came and got her. Started praying. But I think God was kind of testing to see what I would do with a situation like that. Almost, it felt almost that way, you know, because my three years were up. And it's just everything bad started happening with the country and with COVID. And I was like, this was just something else I had to throw on top of it. But I responded. I you know, I mean, I called up Pastor Josh and the church. I mean, I had people praying for her all over the country, and I was praying for her. And, I mean, it was just crazy. I sat in her IC. She was in the ICU, and I sat in the ICU, and I read every scripture on healing in the Bible to her twice over and made sure she knew that God heals, you know. And she forgave everybody who had ever wronged her, and she had some pretty bad wrongs in her life. I mean, so people had wronged her in pretty awful ways, and she forgave them, and she got her heart right with the Lord, and the Lord healed her. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure everybody knows the story. I came to church, and Pastor Josh had the whole church pray, and I got a phone call right after we were all praying, and it was the, the, church, the hospital was like, her liver has turned around. It's coming back. She's... I mean, it was amazing. I mean, this is, I mean, I, I know I prayed for healing before and something little, but this was like a paraplegic getting out of a wheelchair and walking it because they told me she was going to die. I mean, we were only allowed one visit at the hospital at a time, so I would let her mom go see her and her daughter go see her. I didn't see her for two days because we thought she was going to die. I wanted everybody to see her before she died. But God, I reached out and had everybody praying. I read the scriptures. I mean, I think I handled the situation exactly how God wanted me to. And 
everybody's prayers, everybody's love for her, everybody just, I mean, God heard thousands of prayers all over the, I mean, there's people I was calling in different states praying for her, at different churches, my whole, my parents' whole church started praying for her, I mean, I have people praying like crazy, so I think God just heard, it's heard all these prayers and just, you know, he, it, it's pretty miraculous that her healing was like that. If anybody has any doubt, I point towards that healing because that was like from death to I mean, that was right. she's gonna die. She's gonna die to no, she's not gonna die. Well, I don't know how it happened, but she's not gonna die. And then she was on dialysis for over a month. And they told us she's not gonna get off dialysis. This is a lifelong thing. She, she's gonna have to do this the rest of her life. Well, last month. She, they got her lab test and they said, nope, no more dialysis. And she went got her port taken out, no more dialysis. Her, she was totally healed from, so she got complete healing. And I was actually, it was funny because I was accepting the liver healing. Like, okay, if she has been on dialysis, that's fine. At least she's not dead. At least she's not dead. Everybody kept telling her, no, pray for total healing, pray for total healing. And it, he did it. And so, yeah, so, you know, th that just fully solidified what I want to do in ministry as far as like, you know, healing, deliverance, prophecy, just the supernatural things of God, you know, being used in the church again. You know what I mean? People really, really reaching out for those supernatural things of God instead of God being, because what religion is, is God's in the center, and He's impersonal, and He's powerless. That's what religion is. But we don't follow that. God is at the center, but He's very powerful, and He's very personal. And I think, you know, I went to IHOP KC, they have prayer rooms for healing and prophecy. I mean, that, I, I, I just, I've got this heart for like just, and God keeps showing everybody the supernatural. You know, you, if you have any doubt, just look into what God's doing, you know, especially in this day and age, and you'll see. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, so that's where, that, that's, so now I'm going to the Rocky Mountain District School of Ministry. And gonna get my minister's ordination. Yeah, with Pastor Micah's oh. teamed up with me on D sub. Pastor Micah's really teamed up with me on that. So we're gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Um, and that's kind of where I want to head with my ministry is just you know supernatural ministry. And um, you know I know so I'm gonna. That's what I'm doing now. And Lord has changed my life so much. I mean the kind the. If anybody wants to see my tattoos, ask me and I'll show them to you. My ID, I'll show you. I'm not telling you a fictional story. I've got hard proof. And I know it sounds very, you know, very, very dramatic, but it's the truth. And, you know, I, I really relate with the Apostle Paul a lot and uh, some of the Apostles, just like how he was on his way to Damascus thinking that these Christians were a bunch of, yeah, right, I'm going to go destroy them all, thinking he was on, and then God knocked him on his face and said, no, you're not, I'm going to use you now. You know what I mean? That's kind of like the same thing that happened to me. And I just, God just, he told me, he, I'm going to use you, your mind now. That's what he told me when I went to that altar. That's all he wanted me to do. He just wanted to get me up to that altar. You know, because he knew the place I was in. And he knew how much power he had over the power that I was following. And, you know, my family's in church with me now. Hallelujah. You know, they, and I mean, the, the, all everything just culminating accumulating into you know if, if these are the end times well I'm glad God's getting people right for the end times because you know there's just so much out there and I'm still only touching the tip of the iceberg but I mean it yeah that's my life and um, now today I'm you know I don't know I, I just I want to reach out to people in a way where they cannot deny God. And I think, you know, like, if I see a homeless person on the street and they're limping, I'm going to go pray for healing. If I see a homeless person sitting down with nobody to talk to, I go and talk to them. Then I, I find out what they need and I pray for that. You know, I, or prophesy over them or something, you know. And that's the thing. Like, a lot of times, you know, I remember... When I first got saved, there was a lady in a wheelchair. I was with some Christian men, and there was a lady in a wheelchair going across the street. Mm -hmm. And they kind of looked at her, I kind of looked at her, and the Holy Spirit said, go pray for her. So that's what I did. I ran up to her in her wheelchair and I started praying for her right away. And that, you know, that, everybody's looking at me like, 
what is he doing? <laughs> like he just seriously just went up to somebody, doesn't even know. And pray, you know. But that shouldn't be that way. We, you know what I mean? We, it should be a normal thing. You know, it, it really should. It, uh, that's my heart. If if I can be a testimony to anybody or an influence on anybody or anything, I I hope so because, you know, I just you know our time is it's coming, man. It's coming. Jesus is coming back. He gave us these gifts and these abilities and stuff through the Holy Spirit, you know. So that's that's kind of where I'm I'm going. But you know, people go to rock concerts and they go and. They, you know, go to sports events and they're going wild. They're going nuts. And they come to church. It's like, that's way, church is way better than some sporting event. So I go crazy. I just, I, you know, and like, I think it is from where God brought me from. I wasn't born into it. I wasn't, you know, it was, this wasn't just a flow of things for me. This is, you know, this is a hundred percent all my heart. And yeah, if I'm up there worshiping, Pastor Mike is jamming out. I'm going to, you know, like, you know, and, when Pastor Josh preaches and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, acknowledge he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Cheer, get the Holy Spirit pumping in him. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah, it, it, I don't know. I just, I just have this excitement in me for God. Like, I don't know. Like when he comes in those clouds, I'm not, I'm gonna be jumping up and down dancing. You know? like, <laughs> he's gonna look at that guy. But you know, in, in I think in Second Samuel, David, King David, he's the guy to go to when he wants to see how to yeah. worship. Is King David. What did he do in Samuel, the book of Samuel? He leaped and danced before the Lord. And his wife looked at him with badly. So who cares if somebody looks at you badly? You get out there and leap and dance just like King David before the Lord. Because this is about God being worshipped. It's not about what other people think about how you worship God. Because God doesn't care what those people are thinking. He's watching you worship Him. He's watching you worship Him. And if people are looking badly at you for that, who cares? Who cares? I mean, I won't. I'll join you. We'll dance together. You, you come up front. We'll all. I mean, 